This episode today is about the perils of downsizing. Yeah, that's it. I just thought of that right now, actually. The perils of downsizing your system and or also your music collection, whether it's CDs or LPs or even tapes, stuff. How did that work out for you? I want to hear about it in the comments below this video. And I, and I bring this up because I hear from people who just recently got back in. They, and there was a long uh, interlude there where they had to sell their system or really downsize their system. And now they're getting back into it. And they all say, it's so great. They're so happy to be back. Things sound better than they remembered. It's all a big plus for them. And they're having a great time re-entering this hobby of ours, this audiophile hobby. Almost no one has ever said, oh, I came back and it's like, who cares? No, that never happens. <laughs> so if you're in that out of phase, if you're out of the audio game, because you had to downsize and you're just sort of on the sidelines, yeah, come back, come back and join us in this hobby and you will get more out of your music, which is after all the only reason to do it. Now, of course, I say that, but there's also just the love of the gear itself, the way it looks, the way it feels, knob feel, all that stuff plays a role. But at the end of the day, it is about listening to music. Now, the other thing is, oh, I have to make a quick announcement that there will be uh, multiple audiophiliac viewer systems of the day later on in today's show. <laughs> and, I, and, I'm, and, and if you want to send in for future viewer systems of the day, I'm going to put the address on the screen right now. But I'm, uh, how can I say this clearly enough? So many people, and I see this as an increasing trend, are sending multiple emails, the pictures in one, the descriptions in another. No, this does not work. I get too many emails to figure out what goes with what. This, is an, this was always a suggestion, but now it's a 100% rule. You have to include the pictures in the same email as the description. If you send them in separate emails, I keep seeing more and more people doing that, it doesn't work. I'm not going to use your stuff if you send it in separate emails. Please just put it all in one tiny email. Don't give me long descriptions either. That's, it makes it too hard to remember how to talk through the whole thing. So anyway, tidy description, two or three or four pictures, well-lit pictures, well-composed pictures, really nice pictures. Picture quality counts. Anyway, back to the subject of today's show, downsizing your system. Now, all of this came into focus when a friend of mine, a good friend of mine, who has a very high-end system. It's probably a sixty dollars or $70,000 system. Good stuff. Great sounding system. And then one day he goes to play something and his preamp is dead. Calls his dealer. The dealer's going to help uh, you know, get it back to the manufacturer, but it's going to take a month or six weeks to get the preamp back. So at that point, he decides to buy a thousand dollar preamp as a stopgap. I'll stick it in there. It'll be his backup in the future uh, and see how that goes. So he gets the thousand dollar preamp. Now his regular preamp is probably around fifteen thousand dollars. He puts in the thousand dollar preamp and it's like, no, <laughs> this is not okay. It just was too small, too tight. Too the it just wasn't cutting it. Meaning yeah, it made sound. The system played. He still had his incredible speakers. He still had his incredible amplifiers. He still had an incredible turntable and DAC. He still had all that other stuff. But that central point of the system, the preamp, was now, I was going to say downsized, also downgraded to this perfectly decent $1,000 preamplifier. And he was... Uh, I don't know. He barely listens to his system now because he's just not enjoying it. And this guy, it's interesting, this guy is not particularly a gearhead kind of audiophile. He has good stuff because he's can afford it, but not because he, you know, fantasizes about everything because he just likes it. So anyway, I, I'm bringing all this up because all the people that are saying things like snake oil, all this crazy expensive stuff, it's all BS and everything. If you get used to a certain level of quality and then go down from there, you're going to feel it. You will then know there's no, there's no snake oil going on here. That preamp that he had was phenomenal 
and now he's listening to something that is merely good. So, you know, this is a first world problem after all. Definitely, I'm not saying otherwise. But I'm just saying that when you're used to a certain level of quality and then you move down from that, especially a big jump like that, it's hard. So anyway, I, as for you guys, I mean, if you've lived with a decent set of speakers and then you moved and you had to get smaller speakers or something, how did that work out for you? Were you, could you in other words, could you be happy again? That's it. That's what I want to know. If you had a really great amplifier and you needed to sell it to raise money for, you know, life intervenes and a lot of these stories, if you had to do that, could you get back to it? Could you, even with lesser gear, enjoy music just as much? And I'm sure that there are people that absolutely do. So I want to hear from you guys who, who managed to soldier on and enjoy your much less expensive or much smaller system. It's certainly possible. You know, another way of thinking about this is the point of diminishing returns. Now, I've touched on this before, but the idea that there is uh, a, a point uh, for, let's say, amplifiers or speakers or turntables or whatever that you spend more, it's not really going to be that much better. So you're going to spend twice as much. It's only going to be like 2% better. I don't really believe that not at all. Not at all. If you choose wisely, if you if you just blunder through this, yeah, you could spend a lot more money and not get something that's substantially better than the less expensive thing. Yeah, of course. But if you choose wisely, meaning you do your homework, you listen, you touch, the, you go to a store if that's possible, you touch the thing, you experience the thing, you listen to it, maybe you get to take it home, and you say, this is better than what I already own, and you buy that. That is a fantastic thing. And, and if you're lucky enough to be able to afford something that's double the price, is it worth double the money? Now, this is a very subjective call. It absolutely is. But here's the thing. That point of diminishing returns isn't a fixed number. What satisfies you, what you love in an audio system, when you're 30 years old, and beyond that, you say, oh, it's just wasting money. I'm not getting anything extra. Yeah, maybe that's true when you're 30. But by the time you're 40 or 50, and you've been into this hobby for those extra couple of decades, you have developed more experience. You know more about sound. You know more about what you're looking for, what you're chasing after. And then spending more money will absolutely be worth it because you know where you're going. Where before, when you were you know, more of a newbie, you didn't really understand that. And that's the thing. So there really isn't a point of diminishing returns. There may be for individual people at their age, at their uh, stage of their journey, there could be a point of diminishing returns. But as you develop an ear, yes, that point will probably improve, go up. Now, I know it. I know the way you guys think. Yes, you're also aging and you don't hear as well. That's a part of it. But you're your uh, power to discern differences uh, actually holds up pretty well. I know lots of older audiophiles, and they can really hear into the recordings, hear into music, and point out things that people with far better hearing acuity don't notice because they're not listening for it. Oh, so then what about your music collection? Did you downsize your music collection, your physical music collection on LP or CD or tapes? Were you forced to you? Were you for one reason or another, did you get rid of them, all of them or most of them, and then come to regret that? Sometimes to the point that you started to buy many of those titles back for a lot more money than you paid for them in the first place. Now, I understand the pressures that if you move, you get a bigger house, smaller apart, all that stuff that you need to get rid of stuff. I get it. But you have to take a step back before you do it and think, is this really necessary? Because they are a part of my life. Many of my older LPs that I bought in my teens and my 20s, these are precious objects to me. I've had them forever, not just for the music that's encoded on them, just the physical copy, just holding it in my hands. First Rolling Stones record I ever bought in my hands. It's a flood of memories that come back 
when I played that record as a kid, when I bought it at a record store, the lady that I paid, you know, four dollars for the record, all of that, I remember all of that. And it's the, these objects are triggers to my memories. Now, of course, I would still have my memories if I didn't have any of that stuff. But having that physical connection to my past in forms of LPs and CDs, not for me, tapes, is huge. Absolutely huge. I, I haven't given them up. I haven't moved that much in quite some time. But when I was younger, I moved all the time. And I definitely slept the records, in those days just records, from one uh, apartment to the next apartment. When I was doing the heavy lifting, I moved them happily. Because even as a kid, I knew that these were very important to me. And I would miss them if I, if I sold them or gave them away or whatever. And I'm so happy I never did. So again, if you did that, if you downsized your music collection, I want to hear about it if you downsize it and you're happy that you no longer have those things or that you're unhappy and you miss those things. Please share your thoughts in the comments below. Anyway, we're going to move on to the uh, Audiophiliac viewer systems, a whole bunch of them, right now. This system comes to us from Mamet. He's 59 years old. He lives in Istanbul. He is a 59-year-old music enthusiast. His speakers are Kef R3 Meta Amp Hegel H95 Subwoofer Kef KC62. The DAC is a Gustard R26 and the CD player, which I guess is a transport, is the Marantz CD42 Mark II. This is, this is, according to Dave, his crazy system, and he lives in Philadelphia. Now, his Alltech Valencias were restored by Dave with Japanese-style custom walnut legs. There's a CJ Classic EL34 amp, CJ PV10, Lieben 300 integrated, a bottle head crack, that's a headphone amplifier, that Dave built himself from a kit, uh, then there's a Riga Apollo CD player, RARD 301 table with an Audio Technica 12 inch arm, wired by OJAS, and also there's Werner custom crossovers for the Altex. Nice going, Dave. This is Mark's system. He has a Thorin's TD66 Super turntable. The rebuild was by Vinyl Nirvana. Cartridges, there's two, an Ortofon bronze and a white, that's the mono cartridge, uh, preamp Macintosh C1100, the mono blocks are Quicksilver 90s, and those big speakers, those are Kreitz CS style B corn scholars. Jason lives in Bellevue, Washington. His speakers are Vienna Acoustic Beethoven Grand. Power amplifier, Hegel H20, preamp, PS Audio, BHK. The streamer is a Hi-Fi Rose RS250A, DAC, Denifreps Aries 2, CD transport, Denon CDR 1000. Then there's a Nakamichi BX300 cassette. You don't see too many Nakamichis in these viewer systems. And there's an equalizer just for the tape. That's an RCA 10 band. Uh, two turntables here, a TAC TN5BB belt drive with a Denon 130th anniversary moving coil cartridge, and turntable number two is a Pioneer direct drive PLX1000 with an Ortofon blue. Phono stage, gold note PH10 with the external gold note power supply. Hey, this is Nandu's system. His speakers are Ophidian and Canto. Uh, amplifier is a Luxman L595SE. Phono stage is also Luxman. It's an EQ500. Turntable, acoustic signature Hurricane TA2000 with a 24K tone arm. Cartridge, HANA ML. That's a moving coil. And that's a, that's a really beautiful system. Thank you, Nandu. Okay, we are back. My name is Steve Guttenberg, and it's true. I am the Audiophiliac. If you like what I'm doing here on the channel, please consider joining my Patreon. To do so is super easy. The address is on the screen right now. Now, I just want to throw in another thing, a bit of information, is that the 
audiophiliac scammer has been out there uh, doing mischief a lot lately. I keep hearing from people because one of his things is he's, he's scamming manufacturers to get free gear, but he's also trying to get you guys to send him money, he's posing as me, to pay for the shipping to send you, you know, free product that theoretically I review. That's not true. I would never ask you guys for money except when I'm asking for the Patreon. So I don't, first of all, I don't sell gear to the people that watch this show. I return, the gear that I'm not using is always returned to the manufacturer. Anyway, beware of scammers, not just on my channel, on lots of channels, of all sorts of channels. It's out there. Don't, don't fall for it. If you like the show, though, please give it a thumbs up, give it a like, and if you have yet to subscribe, please do so. Oh, and by the way, yeah, August 14th, the sixth anniversary show will be a live stream here on the channel at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. Six o'clock at night, Eastern Time. People are asking, is it 6 a.m.? No, it's not 6 a.m. It's 6 p.m. August 14th. I believe, I hope, that Herb Reichert will be here at my side answering your questions. And I'll answer questions, and Herb will answer questions. Anyway, that's it for now. Uh, I really, really do hope to see you back here again very, very soon. Bye-bye.